Is Israel's war on Gaza now spilling over into the occupied West Bank? Israeli forces have conducted their largest assault in decades, killing and injuring dozens of Palestinians. The escalation is coupled with increasing settler violence. So what are the consequences? This is Inside Story. Hello there, I'm James Bays. On Wednesday, Israeli forces launched a large-scale military operation in the occupied West Bank. For days, they've carried out drone strikes and hundreds of troops have stormed cities and refugee camps. Israel insists it's targeting fighters, but Palestinians say it's attacking homes and civilian infrastructure. The escalation is raising fears that the war on Gaza is spreading into other Palestinian territories. So, will the assault open another military front for Israel? We'll explore all this with our guests in a moment, but first, this report from Katia lopez Hodayan. The scale and scope of the latest Israeli assaults mark the largest military operation in the occupied West Bank in more than two decades. Troops accompanied by armored vehicles, drones and bulldozers stormed four northern cities and refugee camps, tearing up roads and destroying infrastructure. Homes left to burn now line the streets of these Palestinian neighborhoods. Civil defense teams came to put out the fire, but Israeli forces didn't let them through. We broke the bathroom window and managed to get out. My wife's shoulder and arm were burned. Thank God that was all. Palestinians say the frustration is overwhelming. This house belonged to an old woman. They destroyed it. There were walls and a road here. They destroyed them. My relative's house was damaged with missiles and drones. Israel says it's targeting Palestinian armed factions with links to Iran in what it describes as counter-terrorism operations. We have uh, evidence of uh, Iranian uh, trying to smuggle weapons, and we have seen rise in terror attacks uh, in Israel. So we take uh, the measures necessary to prevent terror activities in Israel. The days-long assault on the occupied West Bank is raising fears that Israel's war on Gaza could escalate regionally. Israel is already preparing for Tehran's promised retaliation after the assassination of Hamas political leader Ismail Haniyeh and its exchanges of fire with Hezbollah along the border with Lebanon have intensified. We must expand the goals of the war and include the safe return of Israel's northern residents to their homes on the northern Lebanon border safely. An increase in illegal settlements is also fueling tensions. More than 700,000 Israeli settlers live in the occupied West Bank, and violence against Palestinians has risen since October the 7th. The EU's foreign policy chief, Joseph Borrell, is calling for sanctions, a suggestion backed by some leaders. We will be supporting Joseph Borrell's um, recommendation for sanctions uh, in respect of uh, settler organizations in the West Bank who are fermenting and who are facilitating uh, expansion of settlements. All these developments cast doubt on the chances of reaching an agreement for a ceasefire in Gaza and the release of captives. Katia lopez Oloyan, Al Jazeera, for Inside Story. Well, let's discuss all of this in much more detail with today's panel of guests. And today we have from West Jerusalem, Menachem Klein. He's a professor of political science at Bar Ilan University. In the Jordanian capital Amman is Tahani Mustafa, senior Palestine analyst at the International Crisis Group. And in Ramallah, Abbas Milhem, the executive director of the Palestinian Farmers Union. His family farm was attacked by Israeli settlers last year. So let's start our discussion on what's been going on in recent days in the West Bank. Um, let's go first to you, Abbas, because you are our panelist who's there in the West Bank. I know that you are in uh, Ramallah and most of this has been happening in the, in, in the northern part of the West Bank. But tell me, what does it feel like there? Because this, we're told, is the largest Israeli offensive since 2002, which is when um, the then Prime Minister Ariel Sharon took over the major cities of the West Bank during the Second Intifada. 
It's worse than 2002, absolutely. I mean, it's like an entire invasion and attacks against everything in West Bank. It's the army and the settlers who are doing these invasions and these attacks, you know, targeting most of the farming communities and farmers across their entire farmland areas across West Bank, from Jenin in the south till, from, sorry, from Hebron in the south till Jenin in the north. Yes, I'm based in Ramallah, but my farm and my family, I'm from Jenin, actually, working in Ramallah because I'm the director of the union. But my farmlands and my family farmlands and uh, my town is in Jenin area. That has been under uh, ongoing uh, attacks and violence by settlers and regular and repeated invasions by Israeli army since October 7 until now, although the Israeli attacks against farmers did not start from October 7, but was intensified after October 7, the attacks before October 7 against farmers from settlers was three attacks per day. But now the average of the attacks are 11 attacks against farmers per, per day. And these attacks have resulted in uh, direct killings of farmers in their farmland, like what happened with a farmer who was part of the union in a Sawyer town between Ramallah and Nablus, who was shot in the chest and killed by a group of settlers while this farmer was harvesting his olive crops last year. Other farmers from Surra town near Nablus, while plowing their farmland, they were killed also by settlers, in addition to other tens of farmers and farming communities who were attacked uh, severely by settlers groups who are doing these attacks under the full protection of the Israeli army and then and financed and supported financially by the Ministry of Finance that is run by a settler leader in the Israeli government who is Somotrish. So the situation in West Bank is more beyond and more difficult and more complex than the one in 2002. Well, OK, let me bring combined. in Menachem. Let me bring in Menachem in West Jerusalem. Uh, Abbas has made it clear this has been going on for many, many months. Uh, in the last few days, though, uh, a major military operation. Um, Israel is saying it's planning to target what it calls armed terrorists who pose a threat to security forces. Explain to me what you understand is the objective or aim of Israel's operation. Israel trying to regain control over the West Bank. The PA, the, the Palestinian Authority, lost any control over the area from south up to the north. And already before October 7, there was a, a small uprising in the North West Bank against both Mahmoud Abbas PA regime and Israel. The, in, the, in the name of the close cooperation between the PA and Israeli security. Yes, they but Menachem, to, Menachem, want, Menachem, the PA have been seriously weakened by Israel, have they not? The, the, Israeli, the Israeli goal is to control the area and actually it reminds me what happened in Gaza Strip before the, this war. There were small raids since 2007 into the Gaza Strip. And the, the photos that we see from Tul Karem reminds us what is going on in the Gaza Strip, the destruction and the violence that the Israeli army uses and in Gaza. The method in a small scale is implemented in the north in the Northwest Bank. It is it, it is a red flag showing what may happen in the next stage. OK, so at the beginning of the program in Katya's report, we heard the claims of the recycled ambassador to the United Nations for Israel, Danny Danon, now back in his old job, that Israel, that, sorry, Iran is supplying Palestinian fighters with their weapons. That is something, uh, putting everything at the hands of I Iran, that I've heard many times from Mr. Danon, having had dealings with him myself. Tahani, what do you make of those claims? Well, look, Israel has long talked up the threat of Iran to itself, to U.S. interests in the region. And yes, these groups may be uh, receiving financial support from Iran. Uh, however, their logistics are coming from, in, in some instances, Israel's allies in the region, like Jordan, for example. 
Uh, they may be getting some of it from Lebanon, from Hezbollah. Uh, you know, it's it's irrelevant in terms of where they're actually getting their logistics from. These organizations are not Iranian puppets. They are their own organizations. And there is a context that is effectively leading to their reestablishment. In September, these groups were practically ineffective. Uh, in some cases, they were non-existent. In places like Nablus, Janine, they were severely weakened through targeted assassinations, arrests. Today, they have managed to reestablish themselves, and that is precisely because uh, of the, the severe level of violence that these communities are facing. These groups take a very def defensive posture. That is what they are. They are community defense mechanisms that are pushing back against the violence of an occupation. Now, Israel thinks that it can reestablish a sense of security that it lost on the 7th of October by acting preemptively the way that it is, by creating the kind of violence that we're seeing uh, on more localized levels in the West Bank that we're seeing in Gaza. Uh, Israeli ministers have made no secret about this. They've actually come out and openly stated that they do intend to create uh, sort of mini Gaza scenarios across the West Bank. You know, this is coming from very senior levels. The finance minister, uh, for instance, has openly stated that they intend to do just that. Ambassador Danon, who I just mentioned, was speaking uh, in his answer at the UN uh, in reply to a question from Al Jazeera, one that he deliberately sidestepped. And that was about comments, Ab Abbas, that were made by Israel Katz, the Israeli foreign minister. On X, he said, we need to deal with the threat exactly as we deal with terror infrastructure in Gaza, including the temporary evacuation of Palestinian civilians and other steps needed. Abbas, what do you make of that? The idea they're going to start moving large parts of the population in the West Bank, potentially? What the Israeli government is doing in West Bank is exactly implementing their own policy of annexation of the land and transferring of Palestinians. This has been announced by the Netanyahu government in 2020 when he was calling for the entire annexation and imposing the Israeli law on the West Bank area. It's not something new. It's not well, yes, something yes, yes, that yes, yes, because... yes, Abbas, but we have, you've seen what's happened in Gaza. Entire parts of the population yeah. constantly on the move. Forced evacuations. Yeah. How fearful are you that that sort of thing is coming to the West Bank? They are doing the same, and this is what they publicly said in their even Facebook pages, saying that we will do exactly what we are doing in Gaza. At the time when this genocidal war, war is happening in Gaza, there is an ethnic cleansing war occurring in West Bank. Although the war is focusing on Gaza in terms of this massive destruction of every living and land living there in Gaza, the eyes of the Israeli government and the settlers are on the West Bank land. They want the land empty from farmers and empty from people to do so. They are imposing and conducting all types of crimes there. And I'm, I'm really shocked to, to, to listen to your guest from West Jerusalem saying that it is because those in Jenin doing so and so. The question why those people are doing so, it is because the occupation is still there. Since 75 years until now, those people are resisting and their message and the message of the entire Palestinian people is no more occupation in West Bank, no more settlements in West Bank. This land is an occupied land and the land is owned by Palestinians. And from the time when Palestinians accepted this historical concession and signed the Oslo Agreement until now, what we have gained was loss and loss of our land for the sake for the sake for the sake of settlement expansion. This government does not believe in peace, do not recognize Palestinian independence rights, do not recognize even the existence of Palestinians as a human beings here. What they have committed in Jenin, Tulkarim, Tubas, and different parts in North Bank, North uh, area of West Bank is exactly what they are doing in Gaza. It's the same policy, the same killing machine that they are using in Gaza are using in West Bank. And yes, the fear among Palestinians in West Bank is on the high level. They know that they are witnessing more and more massacres, not only by the army, but also by the settlers who are protected and supported by the army as well. And the eyes is to annex and impose the full control in the Palestinian land, and they are justified they are using. No, nothing can justify the killing of 40,000 people in Gaza, where half of them are women and children. Nothing can justify controlling and stealing, destroying all agricultural farmlands in West Bank. For, I, I don't know for, for what lies they are using. I mean, Abbas, the, the it's, wor Abbas it's worth noting that the points you made on occupation are actually now backed by the top 
court in the UN system, the International Court of Justice, uh, with its ruling in July. Manak, I'm telling to you, I am still, despite what you've all told me, a little confused about the timing of this current escalation by Israel. Because if you look at what Israel currently has on its plate, it's still fighting in Gaza. Its leadership is still supposed to be involved in detailed ceasefire negotiations, or those, those seem to have paused for the moment. Only days ago, there was the heaviest exchange of, um, of fire between Israel and Hezbollah in Lebanon, and still pending we have the threat of Iranian retaliation uh, for the assassination in Tehran of Ismail Haniyeh, the Hamas leader. So why now is Israel acting? Israel operates in the West Bank based on intelligence collection and oper operation uh, opportunities. Um, whenever it is possible, is Israel operates. Israel does not take into consideration the Western world protest and the, the anger, and it, Israel feels that it has free hand to do whatever she wants in the West Bank and promote some radical hopes and visions of its government ministers. The, they they plan to do in the West Bank what they did in Gaza. They started with small portions. They do they few weeks ago they did the same near Jericho. Expulsion of weakened population happened in the Jordan Valley and South Hill Hebron. The, the problem with the Israeli, from Israeli perspective, the problem of the Northwest Bank, the refugee camps, is different. So they need to build up big army units and destroy the roads, the roads leading into and connecting different areas within the refugee camp and the city, and be there, stay there for two days, three days before going back to the state of Israel. Okay. This is the, Tahani, the if I could bring you in. You Tahani, if I can bring you in, as you just heard from Menachem there, he said Israel is acting on intelligence. Um, we've seen that various Palestinian fighters have died, including... Uh, it seems some commanders, including the commander of the Tokaram Battalion of uh, Palestinian Islamic Jihad. Do you think there is a deliberate target list here? I mean, look, Israel has never been able to substantiate a lot of the evidence it supposedly has, uh, and there's never been any pressure on it to do so, right? It is able to go into these areas, conduct targeted, supposed targeted assassinations, um, arrests. Uh, it can go in, literally raise local, uh, sorry, local communities to the ground, which is what it's doing, by the way. This isn't just about targeting supposed uh, uh, resistance infrastructure. I mean, if you're talking about targeting health workers, mosques, um, uh, schools, uh, hospitals, these are not supposed uh, resistance infrastructures, and they've not been able to provide any substantial proof that any of the people that they are looking for uh, are actually operating from those areas. Um, so, it, you know, it, it is, again, very much taking the Israeli sort of PR talking points at face value and then having them completely unscrutinized. But what we're actually seeing on the ground is something far more, far, far worse, sorry, uh, than what Israel is claiming it is doing. Now, as I said earlier, these groups set themselves up as a community defense mechanism. They try to protect their communities when uh, Israel sorry, when Israel does conduct uh, its incursions, which often do come uh, with Palestinian fatalities. And often at times, it's not just resistance fighters that get caught up. Uh, and I, I'm not going to call it crossfire because it's often uh, Palestinian civilians that get caught up in a lot of the targets uh, that Israel claims that it's uh, that it's supposedly aiming at. Um, to, you know, to so honey, can I can I just again, drill down on who these Palestinian fighters are exactly, because in the past, 
in the northern part of the West Bank, they would have been the Al-Aqsa Martyrs Brigade, I think, which would have been um, allied with Fatah. There was a group called Lion's Den, but now we have Palestinian Islamic Jihad operating as well in the West Bank and Hamas. I mean, do these labels matter anymore or, and any rivalries b between these groups or, is it, or are they all working together now as a matter of survival? This is a matter of survival. Look, these groups established themselves in 2021 as a matter of survival. They, when you talk about the Lion's Den, the Janine uh, Brigades, uh, the Tulkaram Battalion, uh, you know, even even now the the latest group that set themselves up, Janud Allah, like these are all cross alliance based groups. These, um, by the way, primarily their membership actually stems not from the most extremist elements in Palestinian society. They're often coming from more leftist secular elements, like Fatah, for example. This is a lot of this has to do with the fact that Fatah's grass roots have lost faith in their own partner in their in their own political tier where they do not feel like their own party speaks for them can resonate with the reality that they live under uh, and therefore have had to turn to more radical elements like Hamas and Islamic Jihad to try and get the logistics and support that they need to fight an occupation this is a matter of survival and that's exactly what these groups are they don't really have an identity in and of themselves they don't have a clear uh, command structure they you know, ultimately, there is no identity in and of themselves that comes out of these groups. They are cross-alliance, a mishmash of, of different um, uh, fact political factions, individuals that have joined for their own rationale. But what does unite them, what is holding this momentum together, uh, is, is, is their fight uh, against an occupation. An occupation by the Israeli military, but also, Abbas, the settlers, the incitement, the harassment of the settlers, often with collusion from the Israeli authorities, the Israeli courts and the Israeli militaries. Um, you yourself had your own farm attacked at the end of last year by settlers. Yeah, it's not only me. I'm one among uh, tens of farmers in my town in Jenin area called Kufurai, where most of the land quote unquote, is classified as Area B, which is supposed to be under the control of the Palestinian Authority. And despite that, uh, settlers have attacked like 13,000 donums, which is uh, almost 4,000 acres of this land, uh, the, the, the restricting the access of all Palestinian farmers who owning the land in that area, including my own farm and my family farm. From October 7 until now, we have been unable to get access to that land. And it is a farmland, a farmland of olive crops. And last year harvest, we couldn't even harvest our crops. And now we are approaching the coming olive season in Palestine. And all these farmers in my town, and as as well as so many t hundreds of farmers in other areas, are are really uh, uh, scaring not to be able to to harvest these all of their olive uh, crops this year uh, due to settlers' attacks and settler violence and. Uh, settlers controlling the land. It's not only Area C, it's Area B and even parts of Area A. OK, Menachem, let me bring you in on, on, on the settlers. None of them are supposed to be there according to international law, and that was reaffirmed uh, by the International Court of Justice in, in the last month or so. But despite that, if Israel wanted, it could rein these people in, couldn't it? The Israeli army and the, the settlers are incorporated they are the same unit. They are the same administration. What the International uh, Criminal Court got it, and the uh, the American administration get it very, very wrong. They sanction individuals instead of sanctions the state, and the state is behind it. They they form up the same entity with two different arms. Uh, so th that, that's, that's the problem uh, here. The, the, the settlers or the violent settlers are not individuals implementing attack against the army vision or the army code of operation. On the, in the contrary, the army is there and does nothing in order to protect the Palestinians. OK, a Tahani, on, on that point, we had fresh sanctions against settlements from the US State Department on Wednesday. They sanctioned an NGO that it said provided material support for settlements and one individual in one settlement who was a security coordinator. As Menachem says, uh, these are not separate, the Israeli state and the settlers, but the US is 
saying that they are separate, is that a deliberate mistake by the US because they know that if they admitted that Israel was behind the whole settler project, uh, then they would have to think about stopping all military aid to Israel, which is something that this administration, the Biden administration, and it seems uh, if she is elected uh, as President Kamala Harris, uh, don't want to do. That's precisely it. Uh, the, the US is very much well aware that this is something that goes well beyond a few hundred settlers, that this is a systematic state-sponsored problem where you have courts, the IDF, uh, that abet sometimes joins in, to, joins in with this violence. Today, we have the uh, obscuring of the lines between settler and soldier considering that many of those settlers that are repeat offenders known to the security establishment are now donning military uniforms. And the U.S. is very well aware of this. These, the, the, the supposed sanctioning regime that uh, the U.S. is boasting about in terms of trying to, to present itself as though it's trying to remedy or do something about the issue of settler violence that's been fueling the crisis in the West Bank, is completely bogus. They came up with this idea back in 2023. And at the time, uh, under the support of the U.S. State Department, those that were trying Trying to formulate and implement this sanctions regime knew that it was a total failure. They knew that it wouldn't address the problem. They knew very well that this was a systematic problem. The reason why they decided to go ahead with it was to prove to those back in DC that refused at that time to try and push for any kind of political process, thinking that you could maintain the status quo that many on the ground, including their own practitioners affiliated to the US security coordinator, the US State Department were warning uh, was unsustainable. So they, they were very much aware that this, this sanctions regime was a policy that was not going to, that was not going to remedy the issue. What they were trying to do was to exhaust all technical solutions so that they could go back to DC and make it very clear that right now is the time to start implementing political pressure, specifically on Israel, that was absolutely adamant on not pursuing any diplomatic route with the Palestinians. Thank you all three of you for your time today. Our guests, Menachem Klein, Tahani Mustafa and Abbas Milhem. Al Jazeera has teams reporting across the occupied West Bank and on the ground in Gaza. Stay tuned for extensive coverage plus comprehensive analysis on aljazeera.com. If you have comments about the program, post them on Facebook. You'll find us at facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story or use X where we are at AJ Inside Story. From me, James Bays and the team here, please stay safe. I'll see you again very soon. Bye-bye for now. Make sure to subscribe to our channel to get the latest news from Al Jazeera.